Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, we are going to talk today about a new product that I found. Uh, actually, a friend of mine told me about this, and so we wanted to go ahead and chat about it. And uh, I wanted to look into it, so I got a hold of the developer, and uh, he's going to jump on here. Let me uh, push this on over and unmute him so you can say. So this is Sean. How's it going, Sean? Good, good, very well, man. Very good. All right. So uh, I, I put this up on the screen, just uh, the limited space. I said personal encrypted NAS. I think that that measures my audience better than everything else this thing does. But this is an amazing little wonder box. And we were talking about it the other day. Um, so I want to start out by saying I'm not being sponsored by this video. They're not paying me. Um, that doesn't mean that will never happen, but at the time we're recording this, uh, we haven't really talked about it. This is just something that's right down my alley, and I liked what I saw, and I had a conversation with Sean the other day, and um, uh, so I decided, to, hey, let's just go ahead and have him on, and we'll have a little Q&A here. So we got like 25 guys watching right now. There'll probably be a few more jumping on right now. So how you doing, man? Good, good. Uh, just working, man. <laughs> We've right. got a lot and, to do. And to my understanding, you teach cybersecurity at Yale, is that correct? As a lecturer, specifically. I do, yeah. So just to give you my background, so um, I've been in the free software world for a couple decades now. Um, started out life as a web developer, did sysadmin work for, for a while, uh, mostly in higher ed. Um, at uh, University of Connecticut, UConn, and uh, Yale as well. And uh, when I came down to Yale, I started doing privacy workshops. So uh, we founded something called Yale Privacy Lab um, out of that. And that's mostly, we'll show people how to use Tor and, and, and those kinds of technologies, just to GPG, et cetera, um, to be private. Um, the lecturing piece is more recent and is great. Um, a lot of folks are interested in uh, cybersecurity, right? Um, yeah. So we teach a cybersecurity class to lawyers. Um, so we take people who don't know technology very well, or at least as well as everybody else does, right? Um, and we teach them how to use the command line, how to dial into machines, uh, and we demo uh, cyber attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah. So if I told you my passwords for everything is one, two, three, four, five, you'd probably be disappointed, right? <laughs> it'd, it'd be very quick to crack them, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. So uh, let me just go ahead and say hi to everyone who is jumping on the stream right now. Uh, so we got Ash and Snap. How's it going there? Simple Tech. Hello there. You guys are chatting about which Linux distro you're using, and Ashton's using Manjaro. So what Linux distro do you use? If you use Debian it. primarily. Um, yeah, I've used and I've set up a lot of Ubuntu uh, variants, cool. um, okay. but right now I'm actually running a Debian variant that is a distro that we rolled at, at cool. Yale Privacy Lab. And uh, it's just Debian, but we have extra repos for things like Tor Project, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. So. Yeah. But Dan Dunker is also on Manjaro. Phil Flores, hello. And uh, is it Rakuzin? How's it going there? Pet the kitty, pet the kitty. Yes, yes. <laughs> the kitty. I actually had the kitty cam on. So it was, uh, you do, I don't usually do the kitty cam when I have the interview set up just because it adds an extra, you know, running three HD cameras on one system and streaming and all this other stuff. Does but here's the thing, nice. Tom. I have a lot of animals. I've got chickens, snakes, etc. So <laughs> next <fun>. time... <laughs> We'll Next see what time we can we'll do. have a cow on or something. All right. There you go. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, yeah. Uh, Ricky's on. Greetings, Ricky. How's it going there? Bruce Scott, hello. Um, Dan hosts his own personal NextCloud server and a virtual machine that runs Linux Mint. Very good. We have Simple Linux is on and Space is Water. How's it going there? And Simple Linux is running PC Linux OS. Very good. All right. So I guess let's go ahead and uh, talk about uh, the device here. Let me go ahead and I'll hit a start recording button and I'll pull up your, let's go ahead and pull up the website first. We're going to walk through that. Sure. All right. So welcome back to Switch to Linux. I'm doing uh, just a couple of clips out of this conversation from uh, Sean O'Brien, who is the one of the developers of Privacy Safe. So this is like a personal encrypted NAS and a bunch of other stuff here. 
And if I can find which view I'm on, there we are. So here is looking at their website, which is at privacysafe.io. And so this is for pre-order at the time we're doing this, right? When do you uh, anticipate being able to ship these products? So we're going to do the dev kit, which is just the board, uh, whatever state we're in, but a functional state, um, et cetera, et cetera, for the software. Um, that will be February 2020. Um, then the full device will be July. July. Okay, so just July next year. And Ashton says, is this affordable for a college student? I'd like to think so, but feedback is welcome on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the dev kit is quite affordable. Uh, if you were to buy a Raspberry Pi dev kit with all the bells and whistles, the case, et cetera, you'd be paying a similar amount. So. Okay, all right. Um, and the size of this box, looking at this, this is approximately the size of a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, so I, I, I can show you. Um, it's okay. basically awesome. credit card sized, very similar okay. to the Raspberry Pi size. We're using the Beagle board, uh, AI board, which is a new board that they just pushed out as an upgrade to the Beagle Bone Black. Um, they are, like I said, credit card sized, so yeah, um, awesome. smaller than your cell phone. And is that a uh, is that a gigabit uh, port in there? Or is it a uh, 10, 1000 or 10, 100? Definitely gigabit. Yeah, definitely gigabit. gigabit. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And of course, I always like to ask these questions. I, I'm a geek. Uh, what's the power draw on the board? What's the power draw on the system when it's running? Oh God, I got I got to look up the <laughs> you know, right. That's I, I knew and, this a week ago when I had to talk to people. So. You know, but I, so is it going to be comparable to a Raspberry Pi or is it going to be comparable? Like I run, um, this is hilarious. My PFSense router actually draws more power than my NAS, which is in a micro tower computer. <laughs> no, it's it's going to be comparable to Raspberry Pi. And I okay. knew that answer, I swear. So just give me a minute or two. I'll actually Fine. look it up. My, my hardware people will be mad at me if I actually give a wrong answer. <laughs> okay. Well, you're looking that up. So... Um, they have malware protection built into this, so you can do a real-time scan of uh, viruses on your system. This does support, uh, you were telling me the other day, one or two cryptocurrencies, um, and in fact, the pro payment processors for them as well. So you can do your own payment processing. Um, a password vault to keep your passwords safe and share and sync, which is kind of the NAS portion of this. So these are kind of all built into this. Yep. So we're using BTC Pay, which is the uh, decentralized, local installable uh, Bitcoin payment processor. Um, hypothetically, most people, I think, will not link their hot wallet, so to speak, to the device. Uh, but it allows them to, let's say, take payments uh, via a device like this and not have to pay any any percentage to a you know Coinbase or you know sure. Binance, et cetera, et cetera. The other cryptocurrency we're pushing uh, very hard, of course, because of the privacy uh, um, aspect of it, is Monero. Um, so uh, we're using the Monero D wallet from Debian uh, and writing a front end for that. But also, BTC Pay and Monero are uh, working very closely together. We're hoping by the time we ship that we'll also be able to promise um, uh, Monero payments through BTC Pay, which I, I think is going to happen. So, so, so Monero and Bitcoin. Or, yes, exactly. Okay. Those are the two mains. Okay. However, uh, BTC Pay does some other things. It does Litecoin and so on. Um, okay. To kind of limit the attack surface, surface especially, and also like what we have to test for, uh, we haven't been doing Litecoin, but you can do it. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, totally. I just had that question come through the, come through the chat feed. That one yep. So make sure we got that one now. All right. Um, so let's talk about um, now what, the thing that the thing that uh, I like the fact is a nice little box that you can run on in your own house or your own business and it'll function as a NAS. Now, what is the size of the drives in here? So for the dev kit, we're just shipping an SD card that is 64 uh, gigs. Um, for the basic version, um, we're shipping one 120 gig uh, drive, and for the thing that we're uh, the pro version, the device that we're we're targeting towards business, um, we're going to do a full rated uh, 250 gig setup. So two 250 gig drives, all solid state. Yeah. Good, awesome. All right, and of course, uh, what we were talking about the other day is everything is all encrypted. 
and I can keep my files here, but you're also working on the ability to push your encrypted files somewhere else as a backup offline storage as well, right? So let's right. talk a little about that because uh, that's something that I personally am not into, but a lot of people would be. So, yep. so go ahead and talk about how that's gonna work. Yeah, so the traditional problem here, right, is that folks are sending their data to cloud storage, right? Uh, they're using iCloud, Dropbox, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you've got a small group of people or even a larger one uh, collaborating via some shared storage, right? And um, they are uh, using all kinds of stuff to send files to each other, attaching stuff via email, et cetera, et cetera. So the first problem we solve is by putting that stuff on a drive locally that the keys, the encryption keys, are controlled by you, the user, right? So you have the private and public key of the encryption of the device. The problem there, of course, is that folks say, well, what do I do if there's a fire, my dog eats the thing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so uh, we offer the ability to sync that data to one of our data centers um, using a protocol called 3N Web. Um, and that protocol only sends encrypted file objects to this data center. So if we tried to look at the contents, we totally could not, right? On top of that, um, the default for that is going to be using Tor.onion services. Um, so we can't look at the metadata, right? We can't look at who's talking to who, where's the source, where's the destination, right? Um, so that's the default. Um, hypothetically, and we'll see in some corporate environments that they don't want to use Tor, that's fine. Um, but if you want to use Tor, you're going to have the maximum amount of privacy. You're, we can't see it. We don't care about it. We verify the integrity of the data. That's all we care about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, then the question becomes, well, what do you do um, if you lose your local encryption keys? So we have partnered with NitroKey. So I've got a NitroKey uh, storage device right here, just a little USB smart card, right? Um, if you plug that into your privacy safe device, you copy the keys to it, you give it to a trusted friend, you put it in a safety deposit box, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter what happens to the actual privacy safe device. We'll be able to restore that from our privacy sync, our three and web service to any new uh, device that you have. Sure. Um, okay. So we're trying to give people kind of the best of both worlds that way. Mm -hmm. um, Otherwise, we found, and, and I think a lot of folks will agree uh, on the stream here, that um, there's a reticence into being in control of your own data because you can lose it physically, right? Yeah. So we'll give you that syncing option and, and allow you to restore it. Yeah. And as we were talking the other day, you can also send that data to other sources as well, um, correct? That's right. We've got to figure out what integrations we're going to do. The first primary thing we have to figure out, which is most important, is how to make multiple privacy safe devices talk to each other. Um, so we're working on mesh networking and that kind of setup. Um, that's the primary thing we care about, right? Mm -hmm. But hypothetically, of course, because you're encrypting this stuff as encrypted objects, you can use some other third-party cloud services if you wanted to. Um, it's hard to say at the moment. Uh, it's going to depend a little bit on, on our uh, you know, development speed, uh, how much of that will be available in February. But I'd say by July, we'll be pretty compatible with, with the major services. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and what are the specific encryption algorithms used as a question from the audience right now? Sure. So we use standard stuff, right? AES-256, uh, we're using GPG, PGP for the authentication. Okay. Um, we're going to use the standard Debian, Linux, E, open source E stuff uh, for everything. Um, so right now, AES-256 is the best balance between um, confidentiality and, you know, you know speed. Um, however, there's rumors, as, as some listeners may know, that AES-256 has been broken, <laughs> which um, I'm not sure that's true. It, it kind of seems, I don't want to say beyond belief, but, you know, it may not be true. So we got to figure that out. If so, we'll, we'll move to 512, something like that. So. Yeah, so yeah, you guys are in the position to do that. 
Um, all right, let me find. Just looking for one more thing here. I uh, can't seem to find it right now. All right. Uh, so we'll go ahead and look at the pre-order button. So are pre-orders open now? They certainly are, yeah. So we had initially uh, uh, positioned this as like a crowdfunding campaign. Um, now it makes more sense, and I think it makes more sense for the product just to do direct sales through the website. Um, so that's what we've been doing. So you can just pre-order it through the website, um, pick one of your three starter basic pro uh, devices, um, and uh, we'll ship it to you when we can. So February for the development kit and July for the full devices. Um, and the full devices will have all of the functionality that we're talking about, the malware protection, all that stuff uh, built in. Um, the development kit, of course, will make sure it's updatable, uh, you know, via via the, the internet. But, um, you know, it's going to depend where we are in February, sure. right? Okay. Um, I will also add, though, the fun part about the development kit, uh, which may not be very clear through the shopping cart, uh, we've partnered with a company called Micro, Micro Electronica, um, and they do what's called click boards. So they do these uh, hackable open hardware little mini boards that you can stick into the top of the headers on the device, okay? And you can add things like a sensor for an accelerometer, right? Ambient light, uh, thermal sensors to see if humans are near your thing. So we're trying to think about ways that hackers can play with our development kit and um, see how much interest there is in physical security. Mm -hmm. And hopefully yeah. that interest is there and then that can end up in the next iteration of the product. But it also means that, um, you know, if folks want to play with that now, they can. And we've got a promo code for, for purchases from Micro. So if you buy the device, you'll get that promo. So. Cool. All right. And it's gonna, is that sensor going to be able to detect if the cat goes near it? I mean, i got to need to know if the cat's messing with my board here. <laughs> I, I, hypothetically, I don't know if the cat gets near it. But it's, uh, the, it's, it's also what people call the evil maid right. problem. So, right? so the, maybe the cat's stealthy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, he might be. I mean, they're, they're pretty, both pretty stealthy. I don't know where they are right now, but they're kind of waiting in the weeds. I know it. I feel like you're going to get jumped any second. So it looks like yeah. the developer kit starting at about 200. The basic vision is about 300, and the business one about 600, it looks like, right? That's right. Right. And and the increases, of course, it's based on hardware costs. So uh, we want to make sure everything's solid state really fast. Um, the business version has that RAID setup, which which a lot of folks in business will want. Cool. That all said, of course, uh, on the basic version, we've got a USB hub, and it's a USB 3.0 hub. Um, so it'll have two Type A ports, so normal USB ports, but you know, fast 3.0 ports and a type C port. So um, you'll be able to plug and play your external drives into it. Um, and if you want to just, you know, buy one of those, you'll have the little mini USB hub uh, so you can plug in whatever externals you want. Um, it doesn't mean, and then this is a caveat I want to give your technical, technically oriented audience, that we can necessarily support syncing of, you know, NTFS volumes from Windows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we can take, you know, an X4 volume from Linux and, you know, it'll automatically sync that to another drive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're going we're, we're gonna to have to figure out through, through interest and, um, you know, as time goes on. But uh, we want to make sure people can plug their data into it. Sure, so. absolutely. Um, I just want to, for anybody else that jumped on later, I am not being sponsored for this video, just uh, gathering information about something that I seen pretty cool. So I, I built my NAS, we were talking about this, and uh, I built my NAS out of a, it's a, it, I run Open Media Vault on just a, a basic micro tower PC, Cost, you know, pulled out the DVD drive, added in two laptop hard drives instead of the one, one um, uh, larger drive, and you know, made a RAID zero of it and works great. I love it. Um, but I'm always looking for ways, you know, other things, other sorts, things like that. Um, so, all right. So actually, uh, like Mitchell's like right on the wavelength. I wish he could jump on here with us because he asked the next question, which was exactly where I was going to. Um, is everything open source with this product? Which I know the answer to, but go ahead. 
Absolutely. Um, so that's one of the reasons we have to be at the price point we're at. We can't do our $35 Raspberry Pi thing, right? Because we're, we have no pr proprietary blobs. We're using the BeagleBone hardware, which is all open hardware, open source hardware certified. So OSHW is the name of that um, certification. Um, so down to the circuitry, yes. And uh, we've got a strong dedication. I personally would not ship anything that's not free software on a device. Um, but also, I mean, we're just we're just not going to do it as a product, right? Yeah. Um, and and that's partially for the security reasons, right? Yeah. It's not just that we love free software, et cetera, et cetera. We want things to be auditable and as secure as possible. Sure. So yeah, there are no no um, uh, binary blobs, et cetera. The slight caveat to that um, is that if you hook up a, there is a micro uh, HDMI uh, port on the device. If you were to hook up a monitor and you decide to install, uh, you know, some hardware acceleration, et cetera, et cetera, some, some proprietary blob driver, well, then we can't control that. You can do that, um, but sure. but we don't do it by default. We have, it's headless, right? Yep. So. And and the software in this, uh, this is a fork of Freedom Box, right? So talk about uh, talk about how the software is working. Sure. So um, I'm, I'm sure some folks are, are familiar with Freedom Box. So so Freedom Box is a project um, to take uh, Debian, uh, set it up as a you know local home personal server, and uh, Freedom Box has a variety of software that you can turn on, turn off, install, and so on through their interface. Um, we're using a fork of Freedom Box that's specifically targeted at our hardware, at the BeagleBone hardware, called Freedom Bone, the Bone, Freedom, you know, BeagleBone, Freedom Bone, right? Um, and that actually allows a huge variety, even larger amount of software to be installed on the device. The lead dev on that project is a guy named Bob Mottram. Um, he's very serious about uh, making sure that these things are available to um, quote unquote normal folks, right? It's targeting people who uh, make it a personal cloud server. Um, now, our modifications are uh, going to be, you know, the specific ones we're trying to do to, to, to um, go after the crypto coin community, you know, make them make them happy with what we're what we're modifying and so on. So we're not going to necessarily put everything on the device. Right. Um, and we're going to be doing some new mods. We're going to put GNU Health on there, which is a healthcare suite. Uh, we're putting something called Mozilla Web Things, which is an IoT gateway that uh, Mozilla is working on, um, on the device, and so on and so forth. So although we're using that default software, which is basically a personal cloud server, um, we are choosing the defaults. Um, hackers, of course, people who just want to tinker, you know, um, who get the dev kit especially can put anything they want on the thing and, and turn things on and turn things off. But I don't want to pretend, for example, that we are Freedom Box or are Freedom Bone. We are kind of pushing our focus towards specific um, applications. And, and those applications are ones that we've heard from the community. Um, you, you know, and folks especially working in a professional context. Um, in healthcare, in law, in business, and so on and so forth. So one of the cool things, Tom, um, having a nice outlet like this, where where you've got a lot of very smart, very dialed in folks who obviously know uh, GNU slash Linux, uh, we want to hear from you um, the things that you want on the device. Yeah. And uh, we're happy to not necessarily cater to you directly, but at least make sure that it's compatible with the things you want. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll do our best to do that. Yeah. yeah, so I'll be interested to have a look at uh, look at how it works and stuff. Um, it does look like your uh, the Freedom Bone website linked on your site is not correct. That takes me to a 404. I was trying to get there, but... <laughs> I really hope their site's not down, but it is. Shoot. Yeah, is uh, that the same one, or there's a freedombone.net. I'm not sure if that's the same organization or not, but. Um... Yeah, it was, but you know what? Yeah, use the freedombone.net. I'll change that link. Um, 
they used to resolve to the same place, but hmm. apparently not anymore. Maybe they, I'll maybe make sure the it happens. Domain went out and they just said, ah, never mind. So, so freedombo.net, yeah, check it out. Yeah, you know. so you can get uh, more information on the whole project at uh, privacysafe.ai. I just dropped that link in there as well. Um, and so anything else you want to say for the recorded portion of the show? Sure. So um, one of the interesting things about the device and one of the use cases that um, we found um, folks are interested in for this sort of private, secure, locally available device is storage of crypto coins, right? Uh, cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I understand, and I think a lot of folks know that there's a bit of a divide between the traditional sort of Linuxy community and and the folks who are doing cryptocurrency right now. Um, and as a company, as as you know, we're trying to deliver a product that people want and are going to use for these applications. So um, I guess uh, something I just want to say is, you know, let us know where you think that line is. If you're interested in doing the BTC Pay stuff and Monero, et cetera, et cetera, or you know, if that's something that totally turns you off to the device, um, we're going to make sure everything is, you know. Um, you can turn it on, you can turn it off. By default, the thing we're focusing on is encrypted storage, right? Um, but we also don't want to go down a road that is uh, potentially, um, you know, and not something we need to put dev time into. So we've had some good interest from the crypto coin folks, but also, you know, we want to know what you guys think. Um, if this is something you would put your coins on, we want to hear it. And if it's not, we want to hear why, basically. Cool. So I guess if anybody has any of that, do you have a contact form on your site somewhere or a way for them to reach out to you guys to let you know? Just that? do hello at privacysafe.net, um, which I'll put in. Um, one of our challenges in doing the website, and it's taken us a little while, is, is stripping out all the googly crap that WordPress has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with so, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we've uh, done okay. Well, but, uh, it actually depends on the theme. Um, I'm playing expert WordPress developers. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, you're 100% right on that. Yeah, it depends on the theming that you're using. Um, that's actually why I build all of my themes from scratch, so I know everything that's in it. <laughs> well, there we go, Tom. I agree with you, believe me. But uh, it's been it's been a bit of reverse engineering on our... our... But the point is, uh, we want to have a booking form where you can talk to me directly. Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have that right away, I, I just want to say to anybody in the audience, uh, this is the thing um, that I think can be very revolutionary in changing the way that people do local... Uh, or data storage in general, yeah. right? Moving it back away from the cloud. Um, I want to talk to you. So please email me, please contact me, and we'll figure out a time to talk, even if it's just, you know, uh, shooting the breeze, right? I'm happy to do that. I want to be available in that way because the most important thing in this part of the development process, but also in general in delivering a product like this, is making sure that you guys are able to have a direct connection to the development. So we want to do that. I'm going to stop the recorded video here. I have some more questions as well, but I think there's a good time to stop here. So we'll go ahead and uh, do that. All right. So here's a, here's a thing that I think is causes a lot of people to say, oh, that's just too difficult. Like, how easy is it for a non-computer savvy user to take this and actually start using it? Sure. So if you power the thing up, um, it will take a, a little bit of config. Um, it's not going to be totally you fire the thing up and you have to do nothing. However, um, it takes about as much config as any other IoT device. So if people can configure an Alexa <laughs> or a Nest or any of these other devices, they'll be able to configure our thing. We do have a tradition on this. If you say Alexa, Alexa, order unicorn meat, confirm. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> tradition but, on my but, show. So, nice. I just wonder how many, uh, I, I wonder how many uh, people have uh, recognized that I am the one that sells the unicorn meat, but you know, no, not really. But, <laughs> there we anyway. go. Yeah. So how easy um, are those to set up? Because I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, so, so um, let's say you fire up our device, right? Um, it automatically will create a local um, DNS address at privacysafe.local. Yeah. So you power the thing up, you plug it in, connects to your network, you go to the browser, right? Um, you go to privacysafe.local, you get a nice little wizard that asks you a bunch of questions. What do you want? Uh, which plugins do you want to turn on? Which plugins do you want to turn off? And uh, do you want Tor? Do you not want Tor? And uh, basically that's it. Um, once you answer those questions, it's set up for you. Um, so, so like I said, it's like router config, but slightly easier. Um, okay. We also are using, you know, some other things called page kite and so on to try to uh, poke through firewalls. Um, we'll be as successful as we can be on that, but I will, you know, I'll, I'll give it a bit of a caveat, especially to the dev kit users. Um, you know, if you can't configure a router, it might not be for you right now. Sure. <laughs> so. Okay. Now, another question is the, uh, obviously, if, if we, we've all run Linux for a period of time, we've encountered an update that breaks something. Um, does the system have a way to roll back an update in case something breaks, or is there a remediation to get that data back, or what do, you, what do we do if the, if the software update kills it? Yeah, so the idea is, um, and, and, you know, hopefully this all works as, as planned, we're working on it, um, that we have uh, snapshots of the operating system uh, in a specific partition on storage. So the BeagleBone has, by default, 16 gigs of storage. Um, that's more than enough to uh, have, a, obviously, as you know, a, a server operating system with Linux, right? Um, but... We will either take a portion of that or more likely um, take a portion of the SD card to store snapshots of the OS. Um, okay. So that if anything goes wrong, you just restore that. That's okay. not a big deal. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, let me see if there's any other questions that I missed going through. So if you guys have any questions watching, go ahead and uh, leave those in here and we will uh, get to those. I'm going to scroll back up to see where we're at in our comment feeds and let's see gotta see where we're at here i see a good comment here by diamond dick shoey where was this five years ago when i built something similar myself that's completely locked down etc cetera, etc cetera. um i just want to approach those kinds of things um because the reason i care about this the reason we're doing this is because We've all known this is possible for individuals to do for a very long time, but there is no commercial product um, that is trying to do this out of the box. Sure. So the problem we're trying to solve is that. Um, and I will say, of course, you know, and I'm sure you would agree, Tom, you know, when we set up our own Linux boxes, we, we have our own ideas about how things should be set up, right? Mm. Um, so, so coming up with like a default config that the quote unquote average user, the ever elusive average user can can configure is hard. Um, and part of our work is not so much worrying about the security and the privacy because we know that these encryption protocols work. We know that, you know, these algorithms work. We know all that stuff is solid, very rock solid because we use it for everything else, right? The hard part is making sure that users can actually plug this thing in, get it to run, and not have to do all the hard administrative stuff themselves. Yeah, um, so that's important. Um, yeah. John asks, does this have a VPN server or client out of the box? So could I hook this up and have a VPN back into my office? Yeah, so we don't have it uh, VPN service out of the box. Um, we have partnered with, uh, for promotion, we've partnered with iVPN. Um, so if you buy the device, you'll get a promo code to use iVPN services. Um, that has nothing to do with the functionality on the actual product when it ships, though. So I don't want to confuse those two well, things. Well, I, I think, though, what, what the question is, is like, I know I'm an extremely weird and rare individual. I actually have a VPN set up for what a VPN is supposed to be used for accessing my network when I'm not here. Is there a right. functionality to get that 
we're not talking. No, about absolutely. Business. And yeah. in, in fact, yeah. um, because we're targeting business environments too, um, yeah. there's going to be a lot of businesses that want to run it on their corporate VPN. So yeah. we've got basically a network config page that you can uh, cool. do open VPN through. So as long as your VPN is open VPN compatible, uh, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, I will add the caveat though. Um, if you're able to do that and worried about that, you, it may make sense for you to do it on the router level as well, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're using it at home. Um, so, but anyway. Yeah. So kind of what I hear you saying is we do have to set up your own separate VPN, but you can use this with that VPN. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And what that will require, and this is why I keep, um, I love Tor. I think it's great. I think it's a really important technology that we need to use. It makes addressing these devices and using, you know, what would be traditional DNS a lot easier to just stick a dot .onion address to the device, right? Um, but we also recognize that most people or most quote unquote normal people, whatever that term means these days, um, are going to want to use it on the clear web. And those folks need a configuration screen where they can do that. So yeah. we will have that. Um, there's, there should be no major barriers to that. Um, unless, like I said, it's some crazy, weird proprietary thing. Yeah. <laughs> so. So if I were to set this up on a home network, would I need to get separate DNS services to root a um, to root a domain name through it if I wanted to use a domain name, or is it going to be uh, easier to configure than that? What's your thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so again, um, your three configure uh, configuration options are um, local only, right? Okay. Um, you just have a local, you know, DNS uh, and or IP, right? And you just to hook up a bunch of them and they talk to each other. Um, the second option is having them talk to a DNS server. Um, we're going to obviously set one up uh, with our data centers for the syncing service. Um, so you can use that if you want to. Um, all of the caveats with DNS and, and potential uh, behavioral tracking exist with DNS, and that's obviously something we can't get around. Um, if you set up your own DNS, you know, at least you're in control of it. You can do that. Mm -hmm. And you could, at that point, of course, use a VPN of some kind, a corporate VPN, whatever VPN, PIA, you know, IVPN, Tunnel Bear, whatever you're going to use. Um, the third option, which is the one I'm going to encourage people who have, you know, what we would call a high threat model, but also it may just be the freaking easiest. And I'd love it if people start to embrace Tor more. Um, if you just use Tor, you're just not gonna have to worry about any of this, <laughs> right? <laughs> because Tor is gonna poke a hole in that router. It's going to give it a dot on your address and you're gonna be routing this stuff through the Tor network. Um, so you're just not gonna have to worry about it. Um, so yeah, so so those are the three basic configs: either local, your own DNS, or ours, depending on how much you trust us, um, and Tor. Those are your three options. Cool. Very good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Um, I think we hit the bottom of the comments there, and I think I've run out of any uh, questions on my end specifically. So if you just wanted to, you know, open mic, say anything else you wanted to say, and uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. Sure. So, um, you know, I just want to make sure we solidify this. Um, this is a free software project. We're very serious about copy left. The team we're assembling is a very, you know, um, devoted, serious free software team. Uh, we are still working out some of the technical details um, and we'll be publishing those as we go. Um, some of those we'll have up by October 1. So we're going to have some basic images you can play with you know, in a virtual machine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, uh, we'll be able to prove it uh, by doing. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure we're there. And I appreciate the opportunity, you know. Um, I know there's some skepticism always around a commercial product. Uh, and I just want to make sure the audience is clear. We're going to have the code out there for you guys to look at, for you guys to run. And we're also going to make sure that you have actual operating system images that you can play with. So, mm -hmm. 
There you go. All right. I guess uh, Diamond says, is the device compatible with other private networks? Um, depends what one means by private networks. I don't see why not. Um, yeah. So um, the protocol we're using is 3N Web. I'll actually drop it into the chat. Um, 3N Web uses the Salt library to do some very, um, I don't want to say basic, but some very well known uh, public private uh, key exchange. Uh, in some ways, it's very similar to um, SSL TLS, um, and we do the negotiation of, of the keys just like that. So um, it shouldn't matter, it should be agnostic to whatever network you're on. Obviously, if you're using Tor, there are some other caveats that come along with that. Um, if you're the only Tor user in, you know, some battleground in Syria, well, then you have to understand what that means, right? Um, you can be identified by your traffic. Um, they can't read what you say, but they'll know goddamn well, you know, that you're the Tor user. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those kinds of caveats are just going to exist in general. And, and part of what we're trying to do, which I think is new and daring, is bringing them, this stuff to a home consumer. I'm not aware of anybody shipping Tor to actual consumers, uh, let alone putting it in a, in a, in a business environment. Um, but it has to happen, and we're happy to do it, um, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it will come with some caveats, right? Um, so private networks, yeah, sure. I mean, you can set up whatever network you want. Um, <laughs> it should work fine, but... Uh, I'm hoping folks are going to want to be into the dot onion addressing thing. I think that could solve a lot of our problems and also uh, remove some of the uh, potentially negative connotations that Tor has. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what some people still think is just, you know, the evil place for all the bad people to be. So um, we have a tradition to feed the kitty on this channel. So I got to got to feed the kitty here. <laughs> there you go, man. I've got three cats of my own, so I feel you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, eventually, eventually, Temptations might sponsor the show. I don't know for sure, but maybe Temptations might sponsor the show at some point. We, we kind of need to. So, you know. A few comments, and I can reply on these in text in a few seconds, but uh, how free is the hardware? Freer than free. Um, we pass all the tests that most hardware does not. So open source hardware, you know, it's a big deal. Beagle board and the Beagle bone board that we're using, they, they passed all the, all the tests. Um, it, is, it is as free as you can get down to the circuitry. And um, it's been, I'll tell you, uh, quite honestly, a very long road to get there. <laughs> we yeah. could have just strapped a bunch of Raspberry Pis to things and called it a product, but we're not doing that because we care. Um, okay. And how long have um, you been blah, blah, blah. working on the project? So uh, tangentially for about six months, uh, maybe okay. slightly longer. Um, but I've been doing work with single board computers for a very long time in workshops and so on. So, um, you know, I kind of feel like it's my life's mission. I know that sounds corny. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you go. uh, got to do something but, with your life, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'd say we're, we're doing a real serious push about two months. We've had a really solid team in place, but, you know, everything takes time to actually get running. Um, let's see. Uh, da -da. Da -da. There's not too many questions, I don't think, that are um, really, really uh, consequential. I do just want to say, um, just real quickly, and then, then I, I think I'm more or less done. Um, we all know that there are um, software services that you can use, the Spider Oaks, the Cryptomators, the, all these other products out there. Um, I think marrying that to a hardware device that you can actually put your hands on is a really powerful thing. Um, ultimately, if you're going to back up your data, you're going to have to back it up to a physical thing anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to kind of bring that concept back. Um, this idea of sort of decentralizing the cloud again is really important to me. Um, and I want to make sure users also, like we're in 2019, like they have the option of, of course, syncing to whatever, syncing to our data centers, copying to other privacy safes, et cetera. But 
The main thing is getting your data off these cloud storage providers. Everybody talks about how bad Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, are. Nobody's talking about, or nearly no one, about the storage that people are using. Um, you know, the Dropboxes, the iClouds, the Amazon, whatever. Um, so that's the kind of thing we want to beat if we can do it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's something we all need to be aware of. Like my recommendation, if you're going to be using those external storages, make sure you're encrypting it on your end and just sending just the encrypted files up, you know, and I would generally steer away from using anything that automatically syncs all your files directly to another device. Sure, it's convenient, but convenience comes with a price. And sure. that's kind of the case. Uh, Skytop says, how much is it going to cost? The devs kit at starting at 200 and then there's um, another one. What is it? 200, 300, and 600, I think. So it's, yeah, so it's uh, 199, 299, uh, 599. Yeah. So, you know, we got to use those digits, man, those nines. Right. I mean, marketers <laughs> approve those 99s sell more products, right? <laughs> All right. But yeah, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 600 bucks. All so, right. yeah. um, well, I uh, just want to, well, I guess we'll wrap up at this point here. So uh, thanks for coming along, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow with a supporter stream. I have one of about five or six different topics we'll talk about. I'm not sure which one yet. And then Friday's the news. We'll see you guys then. So, all right. Uh, thanks for coming along, everybody. And uh, we will catch you in a little bit. And thanks for coming along as well, Sean. Thank you, man. So um, I appreciate that. Obviously, that was, uh, we're off now, right? Mm, yeah. Not yet. Hold on. OK. <laughs> OK. Second. There's always like a, a 30 second lag that if you don't do it right, you'll cut off the last 30 seconds of the stream. So, okay, uh, my bad. Just, just yeah, I wasn't sure where where so I just jumped back over to reset my clock. <laughs>